we all know that part of the reason for the extreme red-blue Republican-Democrat rural-suburban-urban divide when it comes to the actual electoral results lies in the arena of values, sensibilities, and traditions. Our population densities, our geological topographies, and their attendant histories shape our thinking more than we usually, probably always, know. Beyond all of that is an ugly truth which the Democratic Party and progressives are loath to acknowledge. And that truth is that they have almost entirely abandoned the rural voter. And when progressives speak of the rural, it is speech all too often saturated with scornful, mocking disdain and derision. All too often when it comes to the rural, the Democratic Party is hell-bent on the self-fulfilling prophecy that rural voters lie beyond their reach. They tell themselves that the cultural divide is too great, and the utilitarian calculus is that scarce resources of canvassing time and media dollars would be better spent rallying the quote-unquote base, or perhaps just to abandon the electoral field altogether. And that has left rural voters listening to only one megaphone and frequently leaving them with only one choice in the polling booth. To maintain this situation, this dynamic is to engage to what pilots refer to as augering in, a death spiral which intensifies as the aircraft speeds towards an inevitable crash. We can see that in my home county of Macon, North Carolina. Democrats have only two races to vote on in the upcoming May 17th primary. We have a choice in the North Carolina Senate, which for all intents and purposes has already been decided. And we have a choice of who will face the likely winner of the GOP primary for the 11th Congressional District, the incumbent Madison Cawthorn. So we have one meaningful race for Democrats here in Macon County in the May 17th primary. There's no Democratic candidates for sheriff for Macon County. There's no Democratic candidate in one of the county commissioner races and only one Democrat in a race that would allow the party to field two candidates in the general election. Maine State Senator Chloe Maxman and her campaign manager of two successful races for the Maine State Legislature, Canyon Woodward, did not just seek to reverse the augering in. They pulled the progressive plane out of the spiral. They did that twice. They reversed the prevailing physics. Twice. They shredded the conventional wisdom of the Democratic Party playbook twice. Senator Maxman flipped a long-standing Republican State House seat in 2018 with the co-leadership of Canyon Woodward. And they did this in their mid-20s. And then they successfully conjured lightning a second time, unseating the main state Senate minority leader in 2020. And now they've written a book about their journey their strategies, and their tactics. The name of the book is Dirt Road Revival. This is a book about two rural relative youngsters connecting to their roots and their people. This is a book about deep listening. This is a book about empathy. And this is a book about creativity and letting the voters lead. And perhaps most of all, it's a book about hard work. I shrank back from the second half of the book where Chloe and Canyon discuss specific tactics. Good God, I thought, the work, the 20-hour-a-day work, the long conversations, the thousands of handwritten thank-you notes, and so much more. You'll need a nap before and after this section. Chloe and Canyon have so much to teach us because they have walked the walk. This just isn't any interview for me. Canyon was the second Woodward son to grace my classroom. I had Canyon as a philosophy and an AP U.S. history student. We worked together with our mutual friend Julia Buckner on the Jane Hips campaign. My heart is so full when I witness all of his success, which doesn't fit neatly into the cells of a spreadsheet, but rather into the chambers of the human heart. I am so grateful to Canyon for our friendship, for the bonfires, for his prodding me to do this podcast, Mountain Philosopher. I am also grateful for his kind words and Dirt Road Revival. And I'm so grateful to Canyon for introducing me to Chloe Maxman, 
who was every bit the dynamo and kind soul the canyon is. I'm grateful to Chloe for allowing me to weigh in on her campaigns, to scan an article she and Canyon wrote for the nation after their first victory, to read the early chapters of Dirt Road Revival, and for her kind acknowledgments in the book, and for squeezing in this fledgling podcast when the current media demands on her time are substantial. Those who create human geography frames have Appalachia running from Mississippi to New York and into much of eastern Ohio. The Appalachian Trail itself starts just 110 miles south of Franklin and terminates in Mount Katahdin. Chloe and Canyon have started the revival near Katahdin. May that revival flow down the Appalachian Mountains and to every part of rural America, down every dirt road, where we can encounter each other, listen to each other with respect and love, and utilize the political process not to cynically polarize, but to work together for the common good. If you'd like, you can watch this particular podcast on YouTube and see our three live faces. In any event, I hope you enjoy the conversation. This is John DeVille, and I am the Mountain Philosopher. Today's episode, Dirt Road Revival, a conversation with Senator Chloe Maxman and her campaign manager, Canyon Woodward. Book tour starts next week. Yeah, Monday is our first event, right? And that's in Maine. That's the kickoff. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. And you're doing DC and where else? Nobleboro, Chloe's hometown, um, and Boston, and San Francisco, and then TBD, TBD on the rest. Okay. Uh, that means it's uh, you. You'll have to send away for the Chloe and Canyon secret decoder ring, and then you can listen to the shortwave radio, and they'll send out pings, and you'll be able to have Latin longitude, and that's that's how they're going to revive uh, the dirt road is with ham radio. <laughs> um, well, my uh, my guests this evening are Senator, and it really feels cool to say that Senator Chloe Maxman of Maine and uh, my friend uh, Canyon Woodward. They're both my friends. Uh, what these two have done is they have uh, reversed inverted political physics uh, in rural America. Uh, they took uh, first a state house seat in Maine that had been red for a long, long time, if not for eternity. And Canyon and Chloe turned that around in 2018 and Chloe secured a victory there. And not resting on their laurels, they moved on in 2020 to a state Senate seat that was held by uh, the minority leader in uh, the main state Senate, uh, a Republican. And I think that state uh, that seat had been read for a long time as well. And they repeated their success of 2018. And based on all the work that they did in those two races, all their reflections, they have created uh, a book that is coming out May 10th at Better Bookstores Everywhere and online, uh, known called uh, Dirt Road Revival. So we've got a dirt road, and I'm thinking that that's standing in for rural America. Um, exactly what did you all do to create, to foment this revival? How did you, what was dead, and then how was it revived? So, Chloe, I'll start with you. 
what was dead and how was it revived? Hmm. I like the phrasing of the question. I think what was dead was, or at least extremely dormant, is Democrats' understanding of conservative rural America, what folks are thinking and feeling and hearing and <laughs> hoping for. Oh, yeah. so sorry. That's my dog, Elsie. <laughs> um you know, and I, I think over the past decade, Democrats have really all but given up on investing in rural America and listening to the stories of rural people. And so uh, are, we are so disconnected from what's happening on the ground um, in, in non-urban spaces. Okay. Uh, um, quick question. Are, are you able to, to edit this for dog barks and whatnot? <laughs> no, Should I mean, we, that, that, that's we... what makes it real. <laughs> to me. Yeah. I could, I, if it was strictly audio, but I'm going to, for the YouTube channel, um, I'm, 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 my intention is to put, you know, the actual video of, uh, of real talking faces and dogs barking because, uh, that's, you know, humanity is not, is not polished and edited. We're all, we are creatures of one and only take in this life. So that's, <laughs> where, that's yeah. where I'm at. I love it. Sweet. So did you, did you want to add in the Canyon? What was, yeah, I mean, how were you, did you revive it? Yeah. I, I mean, so much, so much goes back to relationships and, and everything that we do. Um, I think that, you know, Obama in 2008 was actually the high water mark for democratic presidential candidates. And he, he really had a true, organizing operation all, all across the country where folks were activated in their communities. And ever since then, ever since 2008, really, Democrats have completely walked away from organizing in rural communities. And so we've let these relationships just completely atrophy and disappear. And it created this huge, huge void into which Rush Limbaugh and Trump and all of the alt-right rushed in and, and really didn't have any pushback because we weren't, we weren't there in those conversations. Um, and so our task now is, is just to bring politics back to people's doors and reinvest in organizing in rural places to, to slowly rebuild that trust that, that has been lost over the past decade plus. Chloe, how do you rebuild that trust? What's what are what are the initial and then subsequent steps to rebuilding that trust? I think Canyon said it so well that you know trust comes from relationships, from knowing someone, from having experience with them. And I don't trust anybody that I don't know. Why would I? <laughs> so you know, and the the way that we campaign, and especially the way the Democrats campaign, is just really extractive. It's like, you know, you show up, you say, "Hey, are you voting for this person? Uh, do you know where your polling place is?" Okay, goodbye. And there's not like there's no foundation there on which to trust someone or you know have any reason to believe that they'll keep their word. So we've really tried to address that with our campaign by talking with people multiple times, following through on every promise and commitment that we make, um, you know, writing handwritten postcards, uh, making phone calls, using our campaign for more than just, uh, you know, getting someone elected, but for really benefiting the community to just to show that we are doing something different and that we need it. How, how do you, you go into a rural area how are you going to help the community if you're not elected? How, how does the campaign itself, how can that campaign itself be a healing uh, exercise? We've seen it happen a couple of times with our campaign. And, and in 2018, before we ever won a race, we had so many people joining our campaign, you know, people who had never done anything political and they were, they were coming out to join us for the first time. And it really felt like we built a movement, you know, people were noticing us and talking about us in a way that we really hadn't expected. And 
Um, and from that relationship and people seeing what could happen in the small rural community, you know, um, this one local group started that was trying to revitalize one of the towns in the district and people kept those connections and those relationships alive long after uh, our race had ended. And then in 2020, when COVID hit, we shut down all of our campaigning, stopped phone calling, door knocking and all of that. We ended up pivoting all our volunteer capacity and our access to the voter database towards calling seniors and making sure people were, were okay during COVID. We ended up calling, making over 13,500 phone calls with 200 volunteers, creating this incredible mutual aid network in, in our district, uh, getting people food, prescription pickups, rides, uh, subscriptions to the New York Times so that people knew what was going on in the world. Um, that is probably our best example of how a campaign can be more than just about getting someone elected. That's incredible. Yeah. What, what uh, you know, can just you, you can follow up any way you want, but I want to make sure you cover what was, you know, there, it sounds like certain volunteers were attracted moth to flame style what was the flame what was what was it that they were attracted to uh especially for the first timers what 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 drew them towards you towards you and chloe yeah i mean i i, th I think about all of the organizing spaces that i've been in whether it's climate or political um you know, you come, you come for the alignment with, with your values and what you believe in, but if it's going to be sustainable, if it's going to keep you there, it's you're staying for the relationships that you form and for the community that you build there. Um, and that's, that's one of the biggest lessons I feel like I've learned from the campaigns and from organizing work is the only way to stay in it for the long haul is, is if those spaces are more than just the cause that you believe in, but are are rooted in in friendships and and that community. And I think a big one of the one of the things that's so important about doing this kind of work in rural places, whether you win or lose the campaign, is um, giving giving that connection to each other two folks to come out of the woodworks you know i remember growing up in franklin and the the vibe of folks feeling like they had to whisper to each other if, you know if they were talking about democratic stuff in in the fitness center or whatever um and you know you, you might live in a place that's that votes 60 percent republican but it feels like it's 99 percent republican um and yeah, electoral politics isn't the end all be all. It's, you know, I think one of the great outcomes in this kind of work is to give people the skills, um, the skills to organize on their own. And then you can take that to, to any, any other arena too, like all of the public education organizing that you do in the mountains um, or, or any other issue cause. And I think that's, yeah, that's a really important piece. One of the things I was struck with, I got exhausted reading the second half and, and, and it's not cause the writing was hard to read. It's like, I can't, I couldn't imagine myself doing that. I, the, the amount of work just like, did they clone themselves? But okay. So you've got 200 volunteers. So You've got 200 surrogates or more, but just the sheer amount of work. And I and I was struck by the handwritten cards. The the clincher cards really hit home with me because that's something my dad did in running his his art business was um, you know handwritten notes that my sister wrote on his behalf uh, in nice calligraphy. Uh, but I I, I remember that, um, and I just want you know how many people running for office put the kind of work in, would put the kind of work in. Um, it's certainly not for the weary. 
It's true. It's true. But you know, many, many hands, right? <laughs> make, <laughs> make it easier. And I, I, yeah, there's no way around it though. It's, it's a ton of work and it's a heck of a lot more, more difficult than just putting the TV ad out in, in Charlotte, you know, <laughs> When Canyon, this one's for you. But you've worked on campaigns in North Carolina. Where, where, where were you? Where'd you do the Bernie work? Was that in North Carolina? Um, that was based out of Anderson, South okay. Carolina, so okay. just over the border. Okay, so you you've worked rural South Carolina, and then intensely in rural North Carolina. What were the differences and and sim- similarities in? And campaigning in in those areas, do they do they do they map perfectly right over the top of each other, or is there a more extracted Venn diagram? And in terms of if you were advising somebody to run again in another main race versus somebody running in a Western North Carolina race, would be the same advice for both, or would you? Is there any fine tuning that you would uh, apply? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of the principles apply anywhere, but but every every context is is so so different. So I think it it begins with with bringing in a a team around you that's really deeply rooted and ingrained in that community. Um, saying saying no to the the party consultants, whether they're coming out of Raleigh or coming out of Augusta is, is key and, and building your strategy from the ground up in that community. Chloe, besides not having deep ongoing connections to community as Canyon puts it, what are the other one, two, three biggest mistakes that the high dollar consultants make? What is it that you and Canyon know that they, they don't seem to know or don't seem to get. Yeah, I mean, the, definitely the central one is not talking to people, you know, not really thinking that it's worth having a conversation with people who have a different letter next to their name. Um, and I, you know, I think there's kind of like a cascade effect from that happening. So one of those is that all of the money spent on campaigns, um, more or less, is all targeted towards cities. And um, so there's not a lot of money flowing into rural spaces, which really impacts, you know, how much attention rural races are getting, how much, how much money those candidates are able to fundraise, how much staff they're able to hire, um, you know, how much money they're able to put into their, into their own campaigns and their own ads and all of that kind of stuff. So, you know, that's one thing is it really impacts how rural races are run. Another huge challenge that the Democrats face is that, so much of what what they do is is driven by consultants, you know, driven by people who actually don't live in the communities that the candidates are running in, and they create content and messaging and strategies that um, that just do not land in rural America. I mean, we've seen that ourselves with how the consultants worked in Maine and the kinds of mailers that they would that they would lock up and you know I think uh, another pretty infamous example is the Susan Collins Sarah Gideon race that Maine saw in 2020 which drew a ton of national attention and the Democrat Sarah Gideon you know her campaign her, her advice was coming from DC consultants and, and she lost um, and I think rural folks really see through that when they it's like pretty clear when you know someone's not from Maine um uh but just like a funny anecdote i was at this meeting the other night of the waldeboro garden club it was like all of these old ladies in this one room schoolhouse and there was this 94 year old lady who went to this school when she was five years old and uh and it really like to me it seemed like everyone was from maine but then this one woman was like well, she kind of like whispered it in shame. She's like, well, I, I, I wasn't born here. I'm not from Maine. And then another one was like, oh, thank God, I'm not from Maine either. And then another <laughs> one, oh, me too. You know, so like, there's this really like um, a little bit nativist, but also like local pride that the Democrats are not tapping into um, when it comes to these really small, special communities. Like that local pride. And what is the local pride? 
Uh, I went down the list of strategic principles. I don't. I didn't write all of them down. And I think you just taught, touched on. Uh, we've gotten commitment. I think we got what that what that means. I think we've got authentic. Uh, you said to be creative, and so I wanted to hear from both of you. Uh, what was the most creative thing that you did? What stands out? Like, oh, oh, this is so cool. We came up with this idea, and it worked. I mean, I I love the example of of, of the hand painted campaign signs. I think that that was especially in 2018. That was something that really stood out to folks. You know, we'd scavenge wood pa- wood pellet pallets <laughs> uh, and paint paint them up with with slogans for Chloe. There was, you know, one volunteer made a big sign with fireflies and fairy lights oh. draped over it that would light up at night and say glowy for Chloe. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> we'd have volunteer parties where we where we painted over old campaign signs and and painted loons and canoes and and different things on them with Chloe's name. And so those were popping up all over the the countryside. And I think that made folks curious. They were like, oh, wow, what, what is this? It's awesome. Chloe, most creative. That's going to be hard to top. <laughs> yeah, I think our signs are definitely a highlight. Um, I remember back in the very beginning, like one of our very specific visions when we started in 2018 was just getting all of our friends to go canvas in rural America and just how cool would it be to have this campaign in the oldest county, in the oldest state in the country, just kind of have like hordes of young folks going down the dirt roads. Elsie, be quiet, please. Um, and so we had this canvas weekend where we invited all of our best friends up and they stayed at our house for a weekend and we all went canvassing during the day and then came back to our house at nighttime. We had keg and we we're playing capture the flag and everyone was having so much fun. And I just remember standing next to Canyon and we were like, wow we made this happen um all of these young folks these 20 somethings and some teenagers went you know went canvassing none of the teenagers had alcohol for the very (laughs) Um, but you know we got all of these young folks um out doing this thing and they had fun doing it and wanted to do it again that's awesome i love it um values not party What's that mean to you, Canyon? Values, not party. You know, I think one of the things that we consistently ran into across the board was a frustration with a fresh, a deep frustration with politics and the politicians that we have in office. And, you know, folks, folks are, are rightly, disgruntled with with both political parties they're so um you know they feel they feel very distant from our communities largely and very much um just way too much in in cahoots with with big money and i think democrats in particular are guilty of not putting their best foot forward in terms of our, our messaging um, coming in and whacking folks over the head with, with policy books that, that just do not resonate. You know, people respond to, to personal stories that, that reflect our shared values. And so that's what we really searched for at the doors. We didn't have, we didn't have like a script that, that folks, would go off of like, like most campaigns do in the traditional sense. It was really about um, this thing and trying to find those, those bits of shared values and and common ground. I want to follow up very quickly. So there is a mantra that has certainly infected politics for the last 30, 40 years. Stay Stay on message, stay on message, stay on message, stay on message. And what I'm hearing is, There's maybe some core values there, but the message development is dialectical. It it, it emanates from a conversation that you're having with individual voters, groups of voters, and and, and the message is is emerging over the, the span of the campaign. Is that an accurate take or not? 
Yeah, you have that's to something speak that we... the nods won't pick up on the uh, on the Spotify. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're nodding yes. <laughs> <clears throat> We always uh, we always give space for the other to talk first, and then everyone just thinks we're being awkwardly silent. Um, it, it was it was really important to us that our messaging evolved and reflected what we were hearing at the doors. One of the best examples was um, in 2020 with the with the presidential race and the Collins Gideon race. Um, and just the parties being the parties, there was so much negative campaigning. You could not listen to the radio. You could not go anywhere without getting, you know, couldn't go on YouTube without just getting blasted by this toxic negative stuff. Um, you know, and we had an existing commitment in 2018 and 2020 to run a 100% positive campaign. We never uttered or wrote a single negative word. But because we were hearing from so many people how much they hated the negative campaigning, we had a flyer, um, no, we had a mailer and put it on our flyers that um, that just had like big letters. We are running a 100% positive campaign. And that was the entire thing. That was the entire message. Um, and we wouldn't have done that if, um, you know, if we hadn't heard that so much and it wasn't really part of our like our schedule, our plan to have our mailer be devoted specifically to that aspect of our campaign. But um, we just wanted folks to, you know, be able to, to see it. Very good. Um, I want to close out, I think, and, and I sent Canyon this and we talked on the phone and I know you're busy, but I, I, I'm absolutely convinced that this is where I really want you to put your, your talents and energies between now and November in a very selfish way. I, I am very concerned a lot of, with a lot of other people about where school board races are, are going to go this fall. And it's not just school board races, but it's politics about schools. Uh, I am... Um, quite taken with Glenn Youngkin's campaign in Virginia. I think he ran a hell of a campaign. It's incredibly negative, nasty, uh, demagogic junk, but it was successful in elevating critical race theory as some sort of demon that exists in K-12 schools, which it doesn't, which painting this message of teachers as sexualizing every conversation k-12 what advice this is this is for the most part school board politics even if they're not rural exclusively uh they're small uh those the campaigns are small so transitioning here from 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 a campaign to a sitting representative a sitting senator and, and a multiple-time campaign manager, I, I call you up on the phone and I say, boy, you guys look like you got your act together. I'm running for school board in rural America. What do I need to do and not do? How do I, how do I win a school board race? How do I fend off, you know, I, I hear, boy, I really want to run a 100% positive campaign, but I'm already being painted as somebody who is going to increase the sexual conversation uh, in a, uh, in a, in a classroom. And I'm somehow going to, uh, send all the white kids home screaming in terror that they're white because of some sort of history that they were taught. How do I, how do I run a, a positive campaign and how do I win? Yeah. Be, being hundred <laughs> percent positive, uh, you know, doesn't mean that you don't, don't, don't push back and stand up for yourself, you know, call, call a lie a lie, but disinformation is, is also just really challenging to combat. And I think that what we found is the most meaningful way to do that is to get off of the Facebook sphere, the Twitter sphere, and go and have these conversations face to face, either with the candidate or, or with, with, with your neighbors as volunteers. And, you know, that's, that's where we're able to bring our, our shared humanity back into it and not get, not get defeated by the, the, you know, the extreme left, right, and deliberately inflammatory media narratives. 
Thank you. Chloe? Yeah, I mean, school board races are so tough. And, you know, in, in a lot of states, like in Maine, it's not partisan. So you don't know what party people are from. Um, but I think it really is about just uh, like listening to folks and modeling something different. And I think every single cycle we have candidates from school school board to select board to state rep to uh, U.S. Congress telling us that they're going to do something different and they're going to be the one who fixes uh, our healthcare system when they get elected. And it, it's just so hard to believe anyone who says that anymore. And so I think, you know, the, the proof is really in the pudding and there's so much that you can do in your campaign to demonstrate to people what you're going to be like when you're elected and why it's important to vote for you. I think that's especially important at the local level, which is, um, you know, it's it's much more intimate and personal and connected than than a, a legislative seat is. So um, that's what I would say. OK, that's good. All right. So I want to uh, hear what I want to hear what you would say as well. You're you, OK. Uh, so you got to so you got to be the interviewer. You're going to put me on the spot. <laughs> I mean, so much of what I've learned is, is from you. And, uh, yeah, uh, and yeah, and, and I've got so much political success under my belt. Um, I mean, I've, I've had a couple of moments, but it's mostly, it's mostly defeats. Um, I do think I have said I've, I've preached this evangel before, and I'll, and I'll say it here since you asked the question that it is important to be out on the water with the sail up at all times. And, I, and I'm guilty of not being out on the water at all times with the sail up. But the only way the sailboat is ever going to move is if you're out on the water with a sail sail ready, ready to go to catch the wind. And you never know what's going to happen in politics. It is absolutely a fool's errand to say we're, we're on May 2nd today that we we know what the political climate is going to be in August. I, I, it will change God knows how many times between now and August and then between Labor Day and early voting. It's, it's a whole nother cycle. So being out there would be the first thing. Uh, listening, staying away from political rhetoric, empathizing. I mean, that's that's always been my secret is, is to is to be as empathetic as possible and to and to true, you know, Bill Clinton, I think Bill Clinton was originally empathetic, and I think it, then it turned into a gimmick where where it was for show. But I think there were points early in his career where he really did, quote unquote, feel people's pain. And um, I had a long conversation with a couple that I just met Saturday night, and we ended up talking for three and a half hours. And there were a lot of areas of disagreement and a few areas of agreement. But we spoke for three and a half hours. We we did listen to each other, um, and there was a lot of pain. Uh, you know, the, the guy had you know, was was hurt in the war in Afghanistan. His dad had had his eye shot out in Vietnam. His wife's brother was a Marine vet who was killed by a delusional sailor. He was kidnapped, throat slit set on fire and i sat and listened to these stories that just went on and on and on for three and a half hours i don't know if i've got the energy to go out there and do that um as a, as a campaign i i uh I, I it'll take me a week to recover from that one conversation um but so but back to school board i i, I think F focusing on the needs of the children more than anything else and, and what do they need to be successful and what do the parents need to feel supported. There is a piece of dialogue that has or a fragment, a slogan that has been injected uh, about parental rights and parental control. And uh, that's a that's a trope that the right is going to is going to beat us over the head with very well this fall. Um but I, and I would have to steer it back or try to steer that parental rights will that we have to have some sort of shared notion. The public school is it's it's a commonwealth. It's a public space devoted to the common good. And so we can't service every idiosyncratic whim. 
And so what are the things we need to come together and what are the things that connect us all? What, what is the common ground? So if I guess if I was running, thinking out loud here, you know, if I was running for school board, it is to try to bring different kinds of people together. And, and it's tricky in, in, in an area that's heavily read because uh, uh, the minority voice, it's going to be hard for that not to be shouted down. But I think you might be able to convince people to be civil and to listen to each other and, and, to, and to create that Venn diagram of, over, uh, of overlapping values. Okay, this is what we agree on. Maybe this is what we ought to focus on for our kids. And the stuff that divides us, we'll have to work on in other spaces besides uh, the public school and, 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 and go in that direction. That's the best I got on the spot, but that's turnabout is fair play. So uh, I'll put you on the spot. You get to put me on the spot. So and you, you want to, now, you can, you can, critique, you can critique that. Does, do you think that that works? Yeah, I th I think so. I I th I think that we need. I think you know it's super super intimidating to to run for a local office because, as you know, especially in small communities like ours. But it's what we have got to do. It's it's you know I think the the Democratic Party as as a national brand is ooh, it's in it's in in deep trouble and and I think that the only way that that we build up and have a chance at passing progressive policies over the next decade is by having a groundswell of folks getting involved in their communities, running for local and state office and, and beginning to rebuild trust in, in that more intimate way where people can actually come together face to face who, who have to share the same community and are, are, disincentivized from shouting, shouting each other down. And, um, yeah. What, after this book tour and after the, the, the movie options are, 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 are signed and, um, you know, I don't, I don't know who's going to play you all in the, in, you know, in the feature film. Um, what do you, what, what's, what's, what do you have on tap for next? What's, what's the, what's the third act? of the Chloe and Canyon story or is that all T TBA and TBD? Yeah, we just have started a 501c4 nonprofit called Dirt Road Organizing. That's really going to scale up and put into practice everything that we've been talking about today and everything that we write about in the book. Um, both in, in Maine and in other states. So we're excited about that to really do some good rural organizing and uh, also very excited to take some time off, enjoy the summertime, and, you know, just remember why we live in a rural place in the, in the first place. So that, is that dirtroadorganizing.org? Is that, okay, all right, we can yep. go there. And... Uh, Canyon, any any other plans beyond what Chloe just mentioned? Oh, I'll be I'll be running some trails. <laughs> Similarly, yeah, you know, sleep a lot, enjoy the outdoors. Maybe go and go and run in the Smokies a lot this summer. Um, but yeah, pouring pouring a lot of our effort into being a resource for for other folks who are willing to to go out there and put in the, the hard work day after day. And um, yeah, a lot of that will th be through dirt road organizing and trying to trying to do trainings and, and bring these, these skills for, for other folks. Well, I want to, I want to thank you both very much for your, your time today, your insights. I'm very grateful for all the work that you've done. I'm very grateful for the model Okay, you, 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 proof of concept, it can be done. You can reverse the physics if you put in the work. Uh, and even if you don't win, we, again, we need to be out there in the field and we need to be doing the community building that uh, Chloe and Canyon were able to do in their, in their two campaigns and what they plan to do going into the future. So I, um, I thank you both very much. I'm going to shut the uh, recording down here, but... Thank you both very much for uh, being with me this evening.
Thank you so much, Mr. DeVille.